if we are thinking about the preservation of, of skeletal muscle as someone ages. So you said earlier that as people uh, age, their protein intake is dropping off. Now, I'm also going to go out on a limb here and say that they're becoming more sedentary. And as I understand it, when it comes to the stimulus for preservation of muscle tissue, resistance training is, is a much greater stimulus than protein intake. So my question to you is, is the problem a lack of protein or is it a lack of resistance training and stimulus? You know, I, I learned in my undergraduate career or undergraduate degree, I should say, um, that, you know, when it comes to physiology, structure reflects function. So how much of this problem is caused by a lack of protein as people age versus a lack of exercise? Yeah, great question. Clearly, you've been reading my Twitter feed. Uh, so yeah, I, I would never argue. Uh, exercise or activity trumps, you know, in my opinion, uh, diet, with particularly with respect to body composition and protein, like hands down. Uh, we don't have the money or resources to do the type of studies where we control diet strictly enough to look at the effect of protein on body composition. But from an observational standpoint, older people who consume more protein uh, hang on to more muscle. Uh, they don't progress towards frailty. They fall less. Um, and, you know, much again to uh, a number of people's chagrins, they don't live shorter lives. <laughs> and so, you know, as laudable goals for an aging person, I look to, you know, some of the issues around, you know, falls, which are, you know, key, key uh, watershed moments and say, well, I don't know. Uh, it seems that there's an association with greater protein that may reflect greater physical activity. And if that's the case, then you're preaching to the converted. You, you wouldn't get me off this show without me saying that, you know, uh, exercise or activity is king and diet is queen. So, and if that means a hierarchy, then I, I, I guess I would, I would be supporting that notion. Mm -hmm. But are you saying as well, just to, just to be clear in, in elderly populations where protein intake has been assessed, are these populations consuming under that 1.2 gram per kilogram sort of target that you mentioned? Some are. It, it depends. I mean, like the the frailer and the more sedentary uh, individuals, yeah, they they get you can get them below the RDA. Some of them are close to the EAR. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, you put an older person in hospital for a knee replacement or a hip replacement and do trace studies on what they're fed in hospital or what the time they spend in hospital if they're there, um, they consume about 0.6 grams per kilo per day. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, there are situations where it's it's clear that people aren't meeting their protein needs. But I, I'm not saying on a population level, and, and this is where the nuance is sort of lost, is that there's rife protein deficiency. Mm -hmm. There's not. There's there's rife overeating of, as you mentioned, hyperpalatable foods, for sure. And to bring in another perspective here, right? So as you're aging, there's loneliness, depression, issues with dentition, bad gums, bad teeth. People just aren't eating enough, right? Is it really that they're not getting enough protein or they're not getting enough calories or not enjoying their food enough? So to help some of these folks, it's not just that we would have to get them more protein. It's that we would have to improve their mood, their social lives, look at their teeth, et cetera. So I, I think it, it gets even more complex. If, if we were, Stu, to have the money to do those kinds of intervention studies, and we don't, but it would be nice. So if anybody's listening that wants to give us that, those funds, we're open. Uh, <laughs> it, there would be a number of angles to address, and protein would absolutely be one of them, but it would be one of several. No, I, I, I absolutely agree. Yeah. I mean, aging is a complex problem and it's not solved by one thing or another. And, and you know, that's the that's the traditional grant getting reductionist type approach that's probably been oversubscribed to without trying to bring together groups of individuals to talk about complex issues like cardiovascular disease, cancer, aging, um, you know, from multiple perspectives rather than siloed ways of looking at it. I, I wouldn't disagree. 
Quick one, folks. I get asked all the time about buying supplements and getting blood tests. The good news is I've created comprehensive and completely free guides for both. Simply head over to my website, theproof.com, to download them. That's theproof.com. Okay, let's get back to the episode. Stu, you you sort of just alluded to the fact that that it sounds like you don't sort of buy the idea that um, – a higher protein intake above the RDA is a concern from a, a longevity sort of perspective, an, an idea that's often put out there. I think that's what you were alluding to. Um, but there does yeah. seem to be a bit of a divide, um, and this might be false equivalence, and, and it may be that more people are of the view that it's not a concern, but at least online there does seem to be a divide or a split among some of the prominent uh, experts using social media and and jumping on podcasts. Um, some some like Volta Longo, for example, or David Sinclair, yep. they they certainly advocate for protein restriction at least through through midlife, and it seems that most of that is is extrapolations from sort of animal research where branched chain amino acids um, or specific amino acids like methionine have been restricted in certain animals uh, models that where they've been looking at lifespan would would i be right that that folks in that camp are mostly focused on on lifespan and whereas yourself or someone like don layman um are a sort of more thinking about health span and sort of mobility and how strong you are into older age and if I am right, are you would would prioritizing skeletal muscle, bone mineral density, et cetera, is that potentially coming at the cost of extra years of life, but improving your quality of life? Uh, yeah, uh, big, big question, lots of answers. First, uh, you know, the balance, and by the balance, I mean like, 90 plus percent of the evidence around protein restriction and longevity comes from small mammals. There is no protein restriction study in primates. There's an energy restriction study, uh, and it depended where the primates came from, Madison, Wisconsin, or the NIH. Uh, and in one study, they lived longer, and the other one, they didn't. So that's energy restriction, which is a far more powerful lifespan extending intervention than protein restriction. So let me just say that uh, I applaud the science that sits around, um, you know, small rodent studies and uh, models of deficiency of certain hormones like larin dwarfs and growth hormone, for example, that are cited as examples for protein as the causative nutrient. And that that's, I think, is a massive overgeneralization as giving rise to growth factors that restricts or, or excuse me, shortens lifespan and increases the prevalence of certain diseases. So I think it's a clever idea. The reality is when you do a review of all of this sort of literature is it's pretty gray. And we only have observational data from humans, obviously, but th there is no consistent relationship between protein intake and longevity. None. And, you know, we've, we've well, we, let me just say that two colleagues of mine and I have had a, pro a paper in reviews that's probably been rejected from several journals. And the number of times I've talked about it, people are beginning to suspect whether it's real or not. It's real. Um, where we've looked at data uh, and using the correct statistics and all of the mortality data that are out there, there's no relationship between protein intake and lifespan or even between plant or animal protein and cardiovascular disease, uh, cancer, or all-cause mortality. So, you know, I, I, I begin to glaze over when people talk about protein restriction as a lifespan-extending um, benefit in humans when you talk about inbred strains of small mammals that live in a cage, only consume that protein day in and day out, don't have access to a running wheel, never were exposed to a pathogen like a global uh, pandemic, never spent extended periods being sedentary where they lose muscle mass. And as you say, maybe you live longer, but you don't <laughs> live better. Um, so, you know, but, you know, Chris chuckles, but it, it, it's, uh, you know, the, the differences between those, 
humans are an outbred species. So that for starters should give you some sort of, you know, these mice are their brothers, 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 cousins, brothers, right? They're inbred <laughs> at, you know, labs for years. And, and, and we're stunned when, when they don't actually act like, well, first, you know, true wild mice uh, <laughs> that are you know, real mice, uh, not in a lab or, or human beings. And, and so, you know, Forgive me for being a little underwhelmed by the the level of evidence that is brought to to that question. And I, I just uh, like I stand to be corrected if if it's if. But my, even my own work, you know, with a couple of folks that hopefully you'll see sometime soon, uh, suggests that it's it's just not a relationship that's there. Mm-hmm.